Hi, welcome to another edition of Family Matters, a show where we talk about issues of importance to families with young children. I'm Chloe Leary, the Executive Director of the Winston Prouty Center, and we are celebrating our 50th year this year, so we brought back our show in celebration of all the work we continue to do with children and families. Today, we have guests from the Prouty Center, Angela Hogue and Willie Gusson, and we are going to talk about child care financial assistance. So um, this is maybe, I think will be a fun topic. It could, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what we look at. But we've been talking a lot, actually, uh, on the show about, um, about how expensive child care is. And mm -hmm. so I thought it would be great to talk to you all as uh, knowing about the program and then how it works at Prouty. So thank you for being willing to come on and talk with yeah. me. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, and also actually the governor's budget was passed in June and it includes uh, a significant investment in childcare financial assistance. So that's great news and that's mm -hmm. another sort of timely part of the topic. Um, but let's just start with understanding like what is this program? How does it work? Who's eligible? So actually, Willie, I think yeah. I'll start with you. Tell us what you know. Yeah, so the, the way the program works in our community, Winston Prouty kind of administers the state's childcare financial assistance program. Um, and eligibility is basically, there's, there's a few requirements, is that you live in our region, um, you're a Vermont resident, um, and that you have what the state calls uh, an approved service need, which is basically like the reason why you need child care or what you're doing while your child is in care. So mm -hmm. for most families it's working, mm -hmm. but it's also, you know, um, self-employment works a little bit differently, but that counts uh, if you're going to school or if you have a health need that requires that your child is out of the home for mm -hmm. um, a certain number of hours each day. Um, and there are a few other kind of like what, what the state considers approved reasons mm -hmm. for needing childcare and then that you're income eligible. Mm -hmm. um, so the, you, you need to kind of similarly to how you would apply for food stamps or other state benefit programs, mm -hmm. you need to like kind of provide all that information and provide documentation for um, what your reason for needing care is and what your income is. What do you think, um, the, why would the state do this? Like, what's the purpose from your point of view? Like, you know, why, why, why does it feel important? Um, well, I think that um, it seems just from working in childcare and being around early education centers, the, um, the way that childcare works and the amount of money it requires to run a child care center mm -hmm. and kind of what families have are able to pay it really the without subsidies from the state there's really no way that that the economics of that are going to work mm -hmm. um, income eligibility is i believe uh, 175 percent of the federal poverty level mm -hmm. so it's still pretty high over federal pro poverty mm -hmm. and um you know still families have difficulty paying the difference between what the state you know offers them mm -hmm. um, as a subsidy and what else they need they mm -hmm. owe their mm -hmm. child care mm -hmm. provider mm -hmm. and yeah Angela, why don't you talk about that a little bit so the difference between subsidy rates are a certain amount right. and mm -hmm. sometimes that either pays the whole tuition or doesn't. Can you talk a little bit about an example that you've seen of families, what families do? Yeah, so I know we have some families who receive, you know, full-time 100% subsidy um, and they their cost of tuition is covered. Um, one thing that Prouty does um, that not all centers do, um, if a family has a co-pay that they owe, so the subsidy will pay they say 100%, but it's not always mm -hmm. what the center charges for 100% mm -hmm. tuition mm -hmm. coverage. Um, so we cover that co-payment in the form of a scholarship. For families who maybe only receive partial subsidy, um, we work with the families on either providing, again, a scholarship um, or sitting down with the families and trying to find out a budgeting plan that works for them. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that's paying you know, quarterly, monthly, weekly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we try to be flexible as far as um, trying to get the rest of that coverage that's mm -hmm. needed. Do you find um, that many families are eligible? I try to encourage every family when we're going through even just the wait list, but definitely the enrollment process to contact subsidy or at least to go online and look at the income guidelines. 
Um, I myself like to talk to somebody, and so I feel like it's easier to offer that up um, for them to call into Prouty and ask mm -hmm. um, any questions that they might have. Mm -hmm. But I do encourage families to at least call because we have some families who maybe only get $20 a week towards their tuition coverage, but $20 a week adds up mm -hmm. very fast. That's true, right, um, so that would be $80 a month, but not, yeah. Yes. Do you, um, Willie, when you think about the benefit level, like $20 a week is, how much paperwork is there? Like, is it where it does add up and there's this other side of the coin of like, how hard is it to go through the process? Yeah, I mean, luckily you, um, you know, with a few exceptions, you only need to do it once a year. Okay. Um, so, so it, you know, there are definitely families that make the decision that dealing with the paperwork, um, maybe if they're, they're self-employed and have like a more complicated income situation or have a more complicated child support, um, either payment out or child support that they receive, they might make the decision not to. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, for families who are receiving regular pay stubs, it's really just going to be filling out the application mm -hmm. and then your two most recent pay stubs. Oh, okay. Um, so not, you know, not uh, an extreme amount of paperwork yep. in that situation, but the more different income sources that you have, okay. um, you know, the, the state requires more mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, you know, that's something that families are aware of mm -hmm. when they're kind of filling out that application. Mm -hmm. So maybe not a lot of barriers in terms of paperwork, it can't, depending on how complicated your situation is. Are there other barriers that you find people sort of, what, what gets in the way of people who uh, might be eligible sort of doing the paperwork? That's for both of you, because you yeah. know. Um, I mean, I think just, uh, you know, I hear from families that have a fear, you know, they, they don't want to take that money from the state or they have a fear that if they're taking it, then someone else isn't going to receive it really? and that kind of feeling. Um, I mean, that's like a, you know, a similar sentiment that I hear about from, uh, you know, reasons why families don't apply for, for three squares, the, mm -hmm. the state's food stamps mm -hmm. program, um, so that might be a barrier for some people. I mean, I think we, you know, our eligibility specialists really try to make the barrier of doing the paperwork and the bar that sort of barrier mm -hmm. um, of kind of not understanding how the funding works mm -hmm. and thinking that you're taking something away from like a, someone else who you feel is more mm -hmm. deserving than you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we try to explain that to people to reduce those barriers. Mm -hmm. That's obviously not the case that someone else is losing out because you're receiving it. The, the state funds all applications that are eligible. Anybody who's eligible will get funding. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a federal and state program, right? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joint. It's not like there's this one bucket of money. Right, okay. right. That is so interesting. That is not the answer I expected, that people yeah. are reluctant. I wonder if that's about Vermont or you, you nodded, like you are aware that families. Yes, I've like had it. families say the same thing in, um, for both the FAP program and even for our um, internal scholarship as well, mm. that there's, they don't want to take it away from another family who they feel like mm -hmm. needs it more. Than, mm -hmm. Wow, mm. that is really interesting. Cause I think, you know, sometimes I feel like out in the world, I've heard people talk about, well, we talk about entitlement programs or people right. living off of public benefits and that, I mean, like we're not, you know, why should I pay for somebody else's childcare? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've actually gotten questions when, um, about, well, they're just staying home and not working and they're accessing this program. So if, that's a real mismatch, yeah. it seems mm -hmm. to me, that people are more worried about taking something from somebody else than, yeah. wow, that, that is interesting. Um, while I'm thinking about it, um, you mentioned eligibility specialists. What what does that process look like? So some and you had said you encourage people to call Prouty. What? Yeah. Who who are they? Who are they calling? Yeah. So um, Gina Janest and Tanya Kangas are the two eligibility specialists at Winston Prouty, um, and so they the amount that they can support someone in filling out the application is really flexible. I mean, they can go through the application with you, um, you know, line by line mm -hmm. if you're having difficulty to that extent, and they can you know, help you make phone calls to gather documentation, or they're also just the person who's inputting that information into the state's mm -hmm. system in order to establish your eligibility for mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're kind of like as involved or kind of just as in the background, you know, finish things, mm -hmm. finishing things up on the um, paperwork end mm -hmm. as each family needs. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, 
thinking about the some of the changes so in the governor's budget this increase there are a couple things um that are changing and they're you know people can do more research but uh, for details but uh, the income eligibility is broadening so um, that's good the um the amount that one can get so sometimes some people get like a 10 percent benefit now so that I, I think it's even less than 20 dollars a week sometimes yes. like what's the least amount you've ever heard somebody getting oh, you i have actually have it right here <laughs> 20 is what i know of that's one of like our families. families. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's been the least yeah. said. No, actually, this doesn't. It would be the, I mean, theoretically, part-time subsidy is obviously a lot less than mm -hmm. full-time subsidy, mm -hmm. but it could be as little as $10 or less. Uh -huh. um, and a obviously, week. like, uh, a month could oh, be. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. Um, right. Why well, do all the paperwork? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, obviously, for school age, the benefits actually, you know, it's a lot less than for infants. So mm -hmm. the, the state has different, um, the age groups are infant, toddler, preschool, mm -hmm. and school age. Mm -hmm. And the the reimbursement rate is higher for right. the younger children. Right, 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 right. That, and that's another change in the budget is the infant toddler rates. Last year, I think the preschool rates uh, went up to a different, uh, 2014 market rate right. and, and infant toddler rates. So that means the amount the state will reimburse. Um, it is based on this market rate, and that's mm -hmm. that difference with the copay rate. Um, so I think the benefit level, they're making a minimum benefit level of like 25% or some something that seems a little more significant mm -hmm. than yeah, yeah. $10 or though. What, so what you're saying, though, is that low amount might be for school-age children. We didn't talk about who all is eligible in terms of age. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah it could go up to a 13-year-old, um, and it can, for a... Uh, you know, someone who has a documented uh, like special need, it can go up to I think actually 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, school age programs like in our area, um, you know, the Meeting Waters Y runs a bunch of after school programs, or the Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. So, so those programs can, or the families that attend those programs can access um, child care financial assistance for those mm -hmm. those children under 13. Mm -hmm. So, and that is one of the programs at. The Winston Prouty Center that's broader than our sort of early childhood prenatal to six. Right. Like yeah. It's actually the 13 or yeah. 18, 19. Yeah. <laughs> that's a little odd, but do people access that in the summer? Is it year round? So for like camps, like how would. Yeah. Well, it's a little bit complicated and I'm probably not the best person to ask, but um, for. So Meeting Waters, they run a day camp. Um, and so they. They do accept the state's child care financial assistance mm -hmm. program. The, the requirement for receiving child care financial assistance is that you are a licensed or registered program mm -hmm. through the state's child development division. And for the state has a requirement that, um, that you can run a summer camp if it's under a certain number of weeks each year. Mm -hmm. You don't actually have to go through that licensing program oh. you do a different licensing program through the vermont department of health mm -hmm. um, and i don't know anything yeah. about that process but, but um so those those programs all that is to say those programs don't accept subsidy because they're not connected with cdd um, okay so it, so it's a a few special summer camps that yeah. do take okay. subsidy and that is how a lot of school age children mm -hmm. access this program mm -hmm. And I'm curious, it's, I just want to emphasize that school age children, th that this program is more broad than early childhood yeah. and early childhood education. We're going to take a short break and we will be right back to talk more about financial assistance. Alicia and Craig needed an early care and education program for their two year old son, Jaden. Eventually, they found a suitable child care center nearby that offers a nurturing environment for Jaden and is open while they're at work. But it costs nearly $10,000 per year. That's more than a mortgage in most states. Even though they're paying the average price for child care, it's a financial burden, and now they're expecting a second child. Meanwhile, Jaden's teacher, Sonia, is worrying about how to put food on her own table. Even though she has a bachelor's degree, she earns less than $15 an hour. In fact, more than half of childcare workers and nearly half of preschool and kindergarten teachers reside in families that utilize public assistance. Childcare is complex work that can impact children throughout their lives. 
Yet Sonia, like many early educators, doesn't receive benefits like health insurance and paid leave. So why do early childhood teachers earn so little when parents pay so much for childcare? There's a flaw in the system. Parent fees alone are not enough to fund quality early education. Let's look at the facts. Parents pay an average of $10,000 annually for center-based care. In certain locations, and depending on the age of the child, the average cost for licensed childcare is even higher. Let's take a closer look at Jaden's Child Care Center. He's one of 40 children attending full-time. Family payments equal $400,000 a year. About 12% goes to rent, utilities, and maintenance. 23% goes for classroom materials, food, and administrative costs. This leaves about $260,000 for personnel. Early care and education is labor-intensive and requires low adult-to-child ratios to ensure quality interactions. Jaden Center, open 10 hours a day with 40 children and three classrooms, needs at least three lead teachers, six assistant teachers, and one director. The remaining money doesn't allow for median salaries, let alone benefits. Parents can't afford to pay. Teachers can't afford to stay. Public investment is the way. We invest in education for older children. Why not for all children? Here's how we can advocate for more public investment in early education programs. Invest in early care and education as other industrialized nations do. If parents are charged, ensure no family pays more than 7% of their income on childcare. Ensure that all teachers have better compensation and workplace support. Those caring for our youngest should at least be paid on par with kindergarten teachers. Question your legislators and candidates about their response to these issues. So let's invest in our teachers and children. Together, we can make it right for children, their families, and their teachers. We're back. We are talking about the Child Care Financial Assistance Program with Angela Hogue and Willie Gusson. Thank you again for being here. We were just um, talking about what, uh, what kind of programs accept subsidy. So we were specifically talking about uh, the program is actually for kids up to 13 and maybe in special circumstances even older, which I think a lot of people don't know, um, and like camps and different programs that might apply. Um, so um, let's just think about that a little bit from the, from the program's perspective. As, like what, are there barriers for programs participating? So we had talked about families accessing the program. What about from the, from the program's point of view? What does it look like? Is it hard? Do you, you know, so we, it has to be licensed with Child Development Division, maybe the Department of Health, but what other things in terms of actually participating in the program, what does it look like? Um, I mean, we have to submit attendance on a bi-weekly um, report basis to the state. Um, so each classroom um, obviously has a sign-in and out sheet each day, and those get returned to the person who submits the subsidy, mm -hmm. um, and then we get payment through the state that way. Um, so as far as the center side, there's not a lot of extra work that we need to do, per mm -hmm. se. Um, I would say in the very beginning, like when we have a family who is enrolling in our center, um, part of the paperwork process of enrollment to be in the program and the subsidy, we try to kind of tie in together mm -hmm. so families can do that all at once. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that helps. So it doesn't feel like a burden. It's not, you know, if, if somebody's listening and thinks, oh, maybe I could help my families by participating in the subsidy program you would say it's not necessarily a hard thing to do. I wouldn't say so. I mean, some of the other attendance things we have to do for like public pre-K, um, we try to tie in and do them together or mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, so I feel like it's something that centers if they're already doing some other attendance mm -hmm. invoicing. And attendance is something that every center has to do right. with Vermont licensing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just basically taking that information from the sheet and entering it into the into database. The yeah. uh -huh. And similarly with, as with families, um, our eligibility specialists are available for child care programs to help okay. with billing mm -hmm. pretty much to um, you know, the extent that that support is needed. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also state tech support mm -hmm. um, people that are accessible to, to all of the child care providers in the state. Mm -hmm. Do you, just thinking back, do you remember if, whether providers 
Are there providers who aren't accessing it who could that you know of, or does it seem like if you can, people pretty much do? Um, there, I think the the child care providers that don't access it, yeah, just really would prefer not to um, uh -huh. deal with computers uh -huh. if they don't yeah. have to. Yep. The yep. state has made, has really required a lot more um, things not mm -hmm. just financial assistance, but other things to be done online in the last five years. So, um, you know, some of those providers have left the field mm -hmm. or, um, or are just more comfortable with, mm -hmm. with computers in general now mm -hmm. and are, mm -hmm. are more likely mm -hmm. to, to access the financial mm -hmm. assistance. Or the other reason a child care provider wouldn't utilize the program is just that none of their families are eligible for financial assistance, oh, right? Um, yeah. You know, if there are only, um, if there are only, their entire population, it would be over income mm -hmm. um, or ineligible for some other reason, right. then yep. they wouldn't access it. Yep. What are some of the things you could imagine would make the uh, financial assistance program better for families or providers? Well, so I mean, the the recent increase in reimbursement is great, but the you know, the fact that we're celebrating it being put at the 2017 market value or market mm -hmm. um, market rate mm -hmm. is obviously still, that's not where it should be. We're in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and so also the way that those, the market rate is, um, is calculated, you know, there, the state doesn't, is really explicit about that even at 100% of subsidy, which is really, it's 100% of what they'll reimburse, not 100% of right. what a family owes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're still explicit that a family will have a copay mm -hmm. after that, mm -hmm. which means, you know, um, on the extreme end, a family that's receiving reach up, which mm -hmm. could be only $640 a month, mm -hmm. that they owe a copayment on top of the state's 100% mm -hmm. reimbursement rate, and mm -hmm. a family surviving on mm -hmm. on that is just you mm -hmm. know preposterous. If mm -hmm. if they're you know also needing to figure out housing costs and and other things, um, and then it it really feels like a strength for us that as like an organization in the community, we are able to provide this service in the way that Winston Prouty provides services and really be. Um, accessible to families and really go out of our way to mm -hmm. support families and child care providers but it's also you know it could very easily be part of the application that families do for um, their three squares yes. and fuel assistance mm -hmm. and Medicaid which mm -hmm. is all the same application it's a fine line because we also like to um, you know, really be intentional about the way that we support families mm -hmm. in this process, but it is adding another application mm -hmm. where they're already doing this standardized application mm -hmm. for really most, if not all, of the other benefits mm -hmm. that they receive. The way that the state has set that up is um, mm -hmm. questionable, I mm -hmm. guess. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. And there might be very, you know, again, because it's sort of a federal program in some ways, there might be, but those are all federal programs yeah. too. Like they're all a state federal program. So, um, well, that's good to know. I think I'll do a little digging. I, I feel like people have brought that up before I mentioned it in terms of advocacy. It's down the list, but and certainly in terms of being family friendly, yeah. it would make a lot of sense to have at least the application go all in one place. I think the family support piece, you know, helping people just answer their questions or be available for that, that, that might be a little trickier, but yeah, um, yeah no, that's definitely worthwhile. Pay attention to that. Uh, you are both parents of mm -hmm. young children. Let's talk a little bit about what, what have been some of your thoughts, not even necessarily whether it's barriers or as you go through thinking about accessing childcare, what is some of the stuff that has come up for you? Um, one of the first things that came up for my husband and I was trying to decide if we would even have a second child mm -hmm. based on the cost factor mm -hmm. and adding a second child in is sometimes adding basically another mortgage payment right. monthly mm -hmm. um, along with other costs. So that kind of was our first mm -hmm. barrier of are we going to be able to do this? Mm -hmm. um, and then my next barrier for myself, I was working part time um, and it was, well, what are the cost 
you know, mm -hmm. benefits right. of right. me staying home mm -hmm. fully or going back to work part time. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky to be somewhere that's been very flexible um, with the hours that I've worked. Um, so I feel like for me, it's been helpful to have that. Mm -hmm. And I know not everybody has that. And an employee who, mm -hmm. um, or an employer who can provide that flexibility, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of what we needed. Um, yeah. So I've been grateful to have that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think the, just the, the, the fact that there's kind of this, ends up being this question mark of like, is it even worth it to work? Mm -hmm because of mm -hmm. the payment you're going to need to make for childcare mm -hmm. is, you know, nothing about that feels good. You know, we did a survey last, about a year ago, the results of the survey from the Child Care Counts Coalition, same sort of narrative in the remarks section, like we, we chose not to have another kid or my career, you know, my spouse works 80 hours and I work 40 and this is how, which is like quality of life. So I think that that's comes up for a lot of families. Mm -hmm. And then the next, layer of well again you know the comments people make around well why am i going to pay for somebody else's kid or you know that's the that's also the wrong question or the wrong point like mm -hmm. how do we help people understand programs like financial assistance and helping families access um, quality early learning or child care is really important for all of us because yes. we need people to go to work I mean, we have you know under three percent unemployment in vermont it is really hard to find people to come work so um it's behooves people to have family-friendly policies, if possible, to be flexible because to try to find somebody else or train somebody else, there are costs around that. Yeah. So I think the more people can understand it's not just family's concerns, it's all of our concerns, um, is helpful. So the other piece that kind of came up for me, because um, I just recently have been looking at, you know, if I'm going to do three days a week or four mm. days a week, um, you know, I... I have learned a lot from working in the early childhood field, mm -hmm. and I know, I can't remember the exact statistic, but I think it's like 85% of a child's brain is fully developed by the time they're five, mm -hmm. before most children enter into mm -hmm. the public school system. Mm -hmm. So for me, part of it was, well, maybe it's not cost productive for me to work mm -hmm. part-time and pay for kiddos to be in childcare, but for their benefit and being mm -hmm. in an early childhood education setting and getting that um, that quality mm -hmm. of you know education mm -hmm. and even the social emotional piece, mm -hmm. that to me kind of outweighed mm -hmm. um, the cost piece. Yes. Um, yeah. And I just feel like every child should get to have that should be a basic right. Like they, uh -huh. if a family wants, I mean, there's some families who who Absolutely. want to stay home and be mm -hmm. with their kiddos, and that's great. I feel mm -hmm. like Broader World is a great community to offer a lot of supports outside mm -hmm. that families can go to to mm -hmm. kind of get out of the house and and get that social interaction. But mm -hmm. um, if kiddos want to be in care and families want mm -hmm. that, it's it's great for them to have that schooling mm -hmm. early and mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. And then I think the. Um, you know, the way that uh, a different program around child care that, that Winston Prouty provides, the child care referral service, also is really explicit. Um, I mean, the rules from the state are really clear that we don't provide rate information to families uh -huh. about child care providers. But it's obviously something that families need to take into account when they're making this decision. And, um, you know, the, the fact that you know, I, hopefully the financial assistance program alleviates some of that really mm -hmm. being the, what kind of like is probably the biggest question mm -hmm. for most families mm -hmm. about childcare. Mm -hmm. And it, it really shouldn't be the biggest question mm -hmm. that you have when you're looking to place your child in mm -hmm. childcare. You mm -hmm. should be thinking about finding a program that is going to support their development, mm -hmm. that, you know, is really going to, to like support your family's mm -hmm. goals around your child mm -hmm. and you know what their next few years look like okay. rather than how much does it cost yeah. and can I afford it yeah. mm -hmm. and people do pick the price and it, yes. and they make make sacrifices around that yeah. so mm -hmm. financial assistance can play a role in that I, any other if if we're just dreaming in our yeah. last 30 seconds <laughs> or so any any other ways uh, we could support families with young children around this I know one of the groups that I've been involved with um, at Prouty has been a, a group that families have gotten together um, to kind of talk about wants and, and mm -hmm. needs. Um, the Acorn Room and the Willow Room mm -hmm. um, are two younger toddler mm -hmm. classrooms and infant room. Um, and some of the parents there have, have talked about just stepping up and asking for what they need mm -hmm. and feeling empowered to come to your employer and say, mm -hmm. 
here's what my family needs right now. Here's what I need. And you might not get, uh, yes, we can do that, yeah. but you're definitely not going to get it if you don't ask. Right. So trying to empower families to try to at least ask for what they're needing yeah. and feel like that's okay to do. Right. Um, I feel like that's helpful. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Trying to be flexible with the hours mm -hmm. um, and days. Mm -hmm. You know, if families are, you know, can't maybe afford mm -hmm. the, the five day a week spot, mm -hmm. um, working with a child care referral program mm -hmm. to find something that maybe accommodates the schedule that they need yeah. is helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Those are great things. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for joining us on this uh, episode of Family Matters, and we will be back next month.